Hello and welcome to Humanities Headlines. I'm George Van Den Abiel, Dean of the School of Humanities at the University of California, Irvine. And I'm here today with Professor Roxanne Varzi to talk about her recent book, Last Seen Underground, an ethnographic novel of Iran. So Roxanne, your book uh, centers on a group of young adults in Iran who launched their own underground theater. Why this topic? And when did you first see underground theater production like this in Tehran? And what does it mean? Wow, okay. <laughs> Way to start. Let's few, see. Few questions. Why the topic? So um, I was teaching actually at the University of London, and it was the first time I was teaching visual anthropology. Mm -hmm. And I was teaching Jean Rouche's Mad Dogs. Oh, sure. And I was writing my lecture, and I was thinking about how that had influenced Jean Genet's The Blacks. Yes. And then I remembered when I was doing my original field work in 2000, I'd seen this amazing avant-garde production of the Blacks. Mm -hmm. Then I thought, wow, that would make a great article. I could talk about, you know, the appropriation of the Blacks exactly. in the 60s, and then what happened in Iran and the underground and the avant-garde. So I thought, wow. So I put it sort of on the back burner, and then that summer, before, right before I came to UCI, I went to Iran with a little bit of research money from SOAS, and um, I looked up the director and I found him and I talked to the company and it just, it was amazing. He was so charismatic and interesting mm. and yeah. full of ideas about theory and I just became fascinated with the ways in which he went about getting the theory and he was translating 20, year, 20 words of Grotowski every night. Mm. <laughs> then I came to UCI and found out that Grotowski had actually taught here. Oh, really? And it just felt like, you know, there was a lot of synergy for the project and it was just... Interesting. So tell me a little bit about it because you call it an ethnographic novel. Right. So that implies fiction or ethnographic fiction and so tell us about your writing of that, what, what okay. does that mean? Well, as an anthropologist, I've always believed that so much of the subjectivity of the anthropologist gets into the project. Mm -hmm. So we already know about that. You know, we have the reflexive turn. And um, my first ethnography, I ended up writing little bits of fiction because I had such a difficult mm -hmm. time talking about, I, I worked on martyrdom in the Iran-Iraq oh, war. Sure. I was writing my dissertation at Columbia University as two planes hit the World Trade Center. Yeah. It was a very emotionally intense time to be writing about that. And um, I turned to fiction. So I started, I had writer's block. So what mm -hmm. better way to deal with it than to create a fictional character? Sure. So I created a fictional character and that ended up becoming part of that first ethnography. Mm -hmm. And I always wanted to write fiction and it mm -hmm. worked really well. Mm -hmm. It was a great way to talk about the men who fought at the front without having to judge, without having to, um, I could protect their anonymity, mm -hmm. I could protect their, 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 their subject positions. Um, it ended up being a very good way to get into that material and I got better feedback actually on that than some of the other stuff. Though, even, though it actually becomes a way to describe cultural phenomena, especially in situations where there's a lot of conflictual evidence or Definitely. difficulty presenting it for a variety of reasons. I also think, you know, Iran is a place that we don't know a lot about. So fiction can really bring in the sensory. Mm -hmm. It can bring in um, a lot of areas that anthropology can't really get at mm -hmm. exactly. And it, um, it, it just worked for the material. I feel like for me as an anthropologist, the material always demands a genre. Mm -hmm. So for certain things I've made film, I've done sound, and it just really depends on the material. And I felt that this material in particular and the way I researched it, demanded a different genre, and I've always wanted to write fiction. There's so <laughs> a little bit of that, too, honestly. Well, now, um, you know, Iranian cinema is, is very well known and accredited throughout the world. I mean, it's a, become a major uh, film uh, hub in many ways. I mean, uh, well, in the diaspora primarily, I mean, although even in Absolutely, Iran. Yeah. But, um, but one speaks less of, the of Iranian theater I mean, one, one knows it less, so well, why is that? Or it's difficult. So you have film, you can it. You put it in a can and you can send it off. You know, you can 
um, hand it, now it's even easier. You can put it on a USB drive and yes. get it out of the country, right? right, right. But theater involves human bodies, right. and oftentimes it involves human bodies that haven't done their military service. Mm. So it's very difficult. It's um, one of the reasons that my field site for this project was Europe is because there's more um, Iranian theater that's exported and shown sure. in Europe because of the visa situation. Right. So we don't get it as much here. We just had a show in the Fringe Festival at the Segerstrom Center last year, and that was really the first mm. Iranian avant-garde theater that we've seen here since mm -hmm. the revolution. So it's, it's difficult to export bodies, but yeah. it's really easy to export a DVD. So in terms of it being a kind of ethnographic novel, um, how, what, what were the challenges in taking that to a publisher? Well, <laughs> yeah, I can only imagine. It, you know, it's um, it was difficult, and I at first I was very adamant about keeping it fiction, you know, and I, I didn't want the academic writing or the ethnography to destroy the fiction. Mm -hmm. And I started writing before I became an academic, and I was told it's going to destroy your writing, yeah, you know. Sure. So I had a lot of angst about that. But then I, um, I'm just really an anthropologist, and I didn't want to throw away all of the work I'd done, and right. the research, and the field work, and it, there's a very different thing that you do as an anthropologist with a text. Mm -hmm. um, you, and I, I think a novelist does have to throw out a lot of that. You know, you right. can't have the critique in there. You can't right. have the expository. So what I did, um, so I, you know, I, I, I tried to, I thought about publishing it, and I went the agent route. And part of the thing that I discovered, actually, is that the academic route is less censored in the sense that it doesn't, um, I'm, I'm not trying to sell to an American audience, right. which really has a different form of censorship in certain ways. I have one of my protagonists is a male Iranian mm -hmm. who didn't, and I won't give away the ending. No, no, no. I won't give away the ending, but let's sure, just say sure. that folks weren't really happy about the ending. And they said, well, this really wouldn't happen. And I said, but ethnographically, it did happen, right. you know, and I wasn't willing to change that to sell it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And in some instances, that's all it would have taken. So that was the, the, the ethnographic that was overriding the desire. So if I were a pure, you know, fictional writer, I could just throw that out and run. But right. I, I wasn't willing to do that. And so I spent a lot of years going back and, and, and shifting it into something that was, um, that, that brought back all of the research and educated. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I ended up being very lucky. I ended up starting a third book um, mm -hmm. on Henri Corbin, so French oh, okay. philosophy. Okay. And I had, I had approached Stanford over that book, and then I noticed that Stanford had published a memoir of an anthropologist who works mm -hmm. in Iran, Mary Hagland. And I thought, well, why not approach? Sure. You know, and it happened to be the editor-in-chief, Kate Wall, and she read it and immediately was interested. So, mm -hmm. and I was, I was surprised because for me, I just thought, and a friend of mine, I, I thought, well, this is it. This project is over. You know, I'm not willing to change it to get it published in, in that milieu. So it's just over, you know, 10 years of work. Okay. Yeah. But a friend said, you have to, just, just send it out. And um, I was really lucky that Stanford was so interested. Well, it, it, it's an interesting problem when we think of writing and publishing within certain pre-established genres. So it's fiction or it's non-fiction. So an ethnographic novel is sort of a, an, an oxymoron. You oh, know. Yeah. And it doesn't and, have and, a place and, in bookshelves. Right? Yeah, it doesn't have a place in a bookshelf. It's not marketable like it's a this or a that. And, and yet one could say uh, that that's probably where you're um, you know, breaking new ground in innovative ways. And the same way the theater you described is trying right. to do some of the same kind of things. And that's where you, you risk you know, censorship, whether it's political censorship or market censorship. I mean, there are different kinds and of And my those. research gave me some experience with that. Yeah. And I realized, I think, just as an academic of Iran, how censored I am in so many ways. And for me as well, um, I, I realized if I wanted to tell the story that I wanted to tell, I needed to tell it as fiction. So that was another major reason to write it as fiction. Um, my, my big concern, bless you, was that, or the academic reviews. I thought, oh God, you know, what are three anthropologists that Stanford sends right. us out to going to think? Mm -hmm. And I thought that way. I thought, well, great, the editor likes it, you know, but what's going to happen there? And, and, and how did that go? Really well. Okay, well, good. <laughs> so, so, so. so what do you hope people take away from your book? Um, 
a new understanding of Iran. Mm -hmm. You know, I think one of the things I've been saying about Iran since I first went back in 1997 is that there's amazing energy, there's zeitgeist, there are people who are doing incredible things that we never hear about. Mm. Um, one of the things that I hope people will get is what daily life is like mm. and that it's artistic and exciting and that people are grappling with the same mm. issues. I think people in the theater world here may read this and and really relate. It's the, you know going out on calls or you know there are other forms of censorship here in theater sure, too, and yeah. it's just as difficult. You know, it's well, so so maybe a better appreciation of the complexity of how lives are living by different people. I mean, I how, hope how so. we, we, and we also experience the, things. The, the genre and, and the, doesn't really matter. Right, exactly. The, <laughs> genre, the genre is a way to get at this issue of that things are more complicated, you know, than, you know, news sound bites would let us exactly. believe. Yeah. The art has a lot to teach us about life, right. Right. you know, as much as anthropology and, you know, and it's possible to, to do field work and, and to, to figure out what's going on. I would like to thank you all again, this episode of Humanities Headlines. I look forward to your tuning in next time. I'm George Vanden Abeel. Dean of the School of Humanities, UC Irvine. Thank you.